Hello, pro hello Professor. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let us start. So uh, uh, recall that we are proving a theorem uh, saying that uh, every symmetric space is spherical. Uh, let me recall uh, some notation uh, which we use uh, in this proof. So, as always, G denotes a connected reductive group, and H uh, is a symmetric subgroup in G. Uh, this means that up to uh, identity, up to of an involutive automorphism of my group G. So it is involutive. but not identical. Okay. Uh, and recall that uh, we have proved uh, uh, at, the, at the previous lecture, we have proved the first lemma. Saying that uh, any Borel subgroup say B, contains a theta stable uh, maximal torus. B itself needs not to be theta stable, but it always contains a theta stable maximal torus, say T. This we have proved uh, in the last lecture. Uh, and uh, if we have chosen such a theta stable torus, then its Lie algebra is also theta stable. Uh, this small German T, let me draw it better. Small German T denotes the Lie algebra of big T. And since it, uh, since it is stable uh, under theta, or better to say under the differential of theta acting on the Lie algebra of G, uh, uh, it is an involutive linear map. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, this uh, Lie algebra can be decomposed as uh, the direct sum of two eigenspaces uh, with eigenvalues 1 and minus 1. Uh, the eigenspace with eigenvalues 1 with eigenvalue 1 is just the fixed point uh, subspace. This is the first summon. And the second summon is uh, the eigenspace with uh, eigenvalue minus 1. Uh, or if you like the fixed, fixed point uh, subspace for the uh, map minus theta as a linear map on the Lie algebra. Uh, now comes the second lemma. Uh, which says that uh, there exists a theta stable maximal torus in G such that this uh, minus one eigenspace uh, in its Lie algebra is non zero. Or, in other words, this uh, T, uh, this torus T, is theta stable, but not pointwise fixed by theta. So let's prove this lemma. Uh, we argue uh, by contradiction 
So otherwise, uh, if uh, such a theta stable torus doesn't exist, otherwise, uh, we have uh, from lemma one that uh, any Borel subgroup in G contains uh, a maximal torus, which is not just theta stable, but fixed by theta, pointwise fixed by theta. In other words, uh, theta restricted to T is the identity map. So we argue, we argue by contradiction. So we assume that uh, uh, the statement of the lemma is not true. That is, uh, all theta stable tori, uh, maximal tori, are just uh, pointwise fixed by theta. Uh, then, uh, since theta acts trivially on T, uh, it acts trivially on everything which is related to T. In particular, it acts trivially, theta acts trivially on the lattice of characters of T. So this action is trivial. And also on the set of roots, because roots are just some characters of T. Uh, so uh, theta acts trivially on the root system. And this implies that uh, theta preserves root subspaces. for any root alpha in the root system. And this in turn implies that theta preserves the Lie algebra of the Borel subgroup, which we have chosen above. Because uh, the Borel, uh, Borel subalgebra, this uh, small b, is just the sum of the Lie algebra of T the Cartan subalgebra and uh, the root subspaces corresponding to positive roots. But since all root subspaces are preserved, this guy is also preserved by theta. And this implies in turn that uh, theta preserves the Borel subgroup, B, corresponding to this Borel subalgebra. Uh, since we have chosen B to be an arbitrary Borel subgroup, we have proved that actually hey, Yes, please. I think we decompose the Lie algebra of G into T and G alpha. And so, exactly. So can we can we conclude that G is in theta is in fact fix the whole Lie algebra G? Well, uh, I mean, uh, theta is an automorphism of the group G. Of course, it acts on the Lie algebra G. This is not a problem. Yeah. And and you and you proved that theta. Uh, fix every every uh, eigen space uh, corresponds to the root system and exactly the, it preserves the, exactly it preserves root subspaces but it doesn't mean that it acts trivially on this root subspace oh it's it just preserves the whole space but uh, this space is not uh, necessarily pointwise fixed by theta we have not oh. yet proved that just, yet. just fix the space right yeah just fixes the space since this space is one dimensional, this means that theta acts on this space as multiplication by one or by minus one. There are two options. And so far, we have not proved, we have not excluded the second option. So the action of theta on G alpha may be non trivial. But what we have proved, we have proved that every Borel subgroup in G is stable under the action of theta, is preserved by theta as a whole. Okay? Well, uh, now uh, it follows, so hence, uh, any maximal torus in G, any maximal torus, say T prime in G, 
uh, any maximal torus can be represented, uh, as we have seen on the previous lecture, as the intersection of two opposite Borel subgroups, say B and B minus. T prime, I'm sorry, not T, but T prime. So uh, every maximal torus uh, is uh, the intersection of two mutually opposite Borel subgroups. But uh, since we have proved that any Borel subgroup is preserved under theta, its intersection is also preserved under theta. So we have proved that any maximal torus in uh, G is theta stable. And even more, uh, since we are assuming uh, that uh, um, uh, the, the action of uh, theta on every theta stable torus uh, is trivial, we are assuming that the statement of the lemma is wrong. So uh, we are assuming that uh, uh, such, such a torus doesn't exist. So this means that uh, every uh, theta stable torus is pointwise fixed by theta. Uh, this means that actually every torus, uh, since it is theta stable, it is pointwise fixed by theta. So this implies that theta restricted to T prime is, ident is the identity map for any maximal torus T prime. And now it remains to uh, remind uh, that uh, a general fact from the theory of algebraic groups, that a connected reductive group uh, almost coincides with the union of all maximal tori. More precisely, the union of all maximal tori in G is a dense subset. This is a theory which you can find, for instance, in the book of Humphrey. Uh, and since theta acts trivially on, on each of these t prime, uh, this implies that actually theta is uh, identity. Which contradicts our assumption on theta. Okay, so uh, we have proved this lemma. Maybe better to put it, put this sign somewhere here. The end of the proof sign, I'll put it here. So uh, we have proved that uh, that the um, there exists. Uh, we have proved that there exists uh, a maximal uh, a maximal uh, uh, theta stable torus, a theta stable maximal torus. Better to say, theta stable maximal torus, such that uh, the action of theta on it is non-trivial. Okay. This is this. This is this lemma. Uh, now let us choose uh, such a theta stable torus uh, such that let us choose a theta stable torus such that that this uh, uh, eigenspace of eigenvalue minus one has maximal possible dimension among all theta stable tori. So let me turn to the next page. Uh, choose. Uh, a theta stable maximal torus T in G such that the dimension of the eigenspace with eigenvalue minus one in its Lie algebra for theta is maximal possible. And now comes the uh, third lemma, which I need for the proof of the theorem. Uh, 
Uh, this lemma says that under this choice of a maximal torus T with uh, the minus one eigenspace maximal possible of maximal possible dimension, uh, a very, uh, the root decomposition with respect to this torus T has the following property. If you take a root alpha, which is fixed by theta, then actually the root subspace corresponding to this alpha is also pointwise fixed by theta, not just fixed as a subspace, as we have seen in the proof of the previous lemma, for instance, but it, actually in this case, it is pointwise fixed by theta. It is contained in uh, uh, the subspace, the subalgebra of theta, theta invariant uh, vectors, theta invariant elements. So this is a property of the root decomposition with respect to a theta stable maximal torus such that uh, it's minus one eigenspace is uh, maximal possible or maximal possible dimension. So result. Yes. Lemma three only applies to this maximal torus, right? Exactly, exactly. With this assumption, with this special assumption that this dimension is maximal possible among all theta stable tori. So let me prove this lemma. Uh, well, uh, let me start with the following general observation that uh, the character lattice of T can be embedded in the dual of the Lie algebra of T, in the dual vector space of the Lie algebra of T. Uh, by uh, taking each character, a character is just a, an algebraic group homomorphism from T to the multiplicative group, K cross. So if you uh, take this character lambda to its differential at unity, which is just the uh, linear function, a linear function on the Lie algebra, So this association is actually an embedding uh, from the character lattice uh, to the dual of the Lie algebra. This is a general fact again. Uh, so uh, we, may, uh, we, we may view each character as a linear function on, on the Lie algebra of T. And actually we shall denote this function by the same letter lambda. So we drop uh, this differential sign by abuse of notation. Okay, so we view uh, the lattice of characters as a sub lattice in this vector space in the dual of the Lie algebra. This is quite standard. Now, uh, let us observe that a root alpha under this embedding, a root alpha considered as a linear function on T, on the Lie algebra of T, is theta stable if and only if uh, alpha as a linear function on the Lie algebra vanishes on the minus one eigenspace for theta. So if you have, if, if you have an, uh, an involutive linear map uh, on T, on the Lie algebra of T, on this small T, uh, uh, then uh, this map acts also on linear functions and a linear function is uh, fixed by uh, theta if and only if it vanishes on the minus one eigenspace. Okay, uh, now let's consider this centralizer. Uh, this centralizer, so this uh, German letter Z will denote the centralizer in the Lie algebra of G of this minus one eigenspace. Okay, uh, let me denote it for short uh, by uh, uh, the German, small German letter L. So L is the Lie algebra, which is the centralizer uh, of this minus one eigenspace in the, in the whole Lie algebra of G. What is the structure of this centralizer? Which elements of G commute with this minus one eigenspace? Well, of course, the whole Lie algebra of T commutes uh, with uh, this uh, subspace because it is commutative, it is a commutative Lie algebra. And also the centralizer contains those root subspaces 
G alpha, uh, which correspond uh, to the roots fixed by theta. This follows from, from the above observation. So uh, if uh, uh, a, root, uh, a root alpha is uh, preserved by theta, if and only if it vanishes on this eigenspace, and this means uh, that uh, this eigenspace acts uh, by zero on, this, on the respective root subspace, because uh, uh, it acts uh, by multiplication with the character alpha, and alpha vanishes uh, on this subspace. So this is the structure of the centralizer uh, of uh, t minus theta, uh, t over minus theta, uh, in the whole Lie algebra of G. Uh, it is known that a centralizer of uh, toral subalgebras are reductive subalgebras. So this guy is a reductive uh, Lie subalgebra, which basically means that it is uh, the Lie algebra of a reductive subgroup in G. Uh, and it follows from the structure of reductive groups that uh, it can be decomposed as the direct sum of its center and uh, its derived subalgebra, the commutator subalgebra. So uh, this center is just a toral subalgebra. It is contained uh, in the Lie algebra of chi of T. And it contains uh, this eigenspace t minus theta. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the derived subalgebra is uh, a semi-simple Lie algebra. It is semi-simple, semi-simple, and also reductive, of course. Since it is semi-simple, it is automatically reductive. It is semi-simple, and of course, it is theta stable again. Because uh, L is theta stable, and its commutator subalgebra is also stable under the automorphism theta as well. Well, and by the way, uh, let's uh, observe that uh, the, all these root subspaces belong to the derived subalgebra of L. So to its semi-simple part. Okay. Now, uh, if uh, if uh, the statement of the lemma is not true, so if uh, some of if some of these uh, root subspaces are not contained in a theta fixed uh, theta fixed subspace of G theta fixed subalgebra of G. Then uh, this means uh, this means basically that uh, the restriction of theta to the derived subalgebra of G, which contains uh, uh, all these root subspaces, uh, is uh, not identical. So if the restriction of theta uh, to the semi-simple part of L is not identical, then uh, uh, it induces a non-trivial involutive automorphism of the respective semi-simple group. Uh, and this means by the previous lemma, by, by the second lemma, that uh, there exists a theta stable maximal torus, say S, in the derived subgroup of the Lie group, of the algebraic group L, uh, corresponding to this uh, Lie algebra, small German L. So this big L is the centralizer of, of the same subspace uh, T minus theta uh, in the algebraic group G under the joint action. OK? So if a theta restricted to this uh, Lie subalgebra is not identical, then, then uh, it gives you a non-trivial involution of this semi-simple algebraic group. And by lemma two, uh, this means that uh, this uh, uh, algebraic group contains a theta stable uh, maximal torus uh, such that uh, it's minus one eigenspace for theta in its Lie algebra is non-zero. This is by lemma two. 
applied now to this uh to this Professor, sorry how, yes. how can we use that the Lie algebra l is reductive uh well i use it in the following way uh since l is reductive it's derived subalgebra is semi simple no no how can we conclude that it is reductive i'm asking the reason Ah, okay. So your question is why it is reductive. Well, again, it is a general fact. Uh, I, I refer to the book of Humphrey, for instance. Uh, I don't want to prove it now. Uh, it's a general fact that centralizers uh, of tori are reductive. So this is... Centralizers of tori are reductive. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No okay. need to be maximal for tori, right? Tori. Excuse me? Not necessarily maximal, yeah. Well, centralizer of any tori uh, are reductive. Centralizer, uh, centralizers of tori in reductive groups or reductively algebras, if you like, are reductive. Okay. So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, if if this made, if the statement of lemma three is uh, wrong, is is false. Then uh, we have shown that uh, there exists uh, of uh, uh, there exists a theta stable maximal torus in the semi-simple part of L uh, with non-zero minus one eigenspace in its Lie algebra minus one eigenspace for theta in its Lie algebra. But now we can replace we can replace T with another theta stable uh, maximal torus, say T prime. Which is just a, a product of the center of L and this S sitting in the semi simple part of L. Uh, and uh, uh, the minus one eigenspace for theta acting on this torus, T prime, is bigger by dimension because it contains uh, the minus one eigenspace, which we have seen before, this one because it sits uh, in the center of, uh, of L. And on the group level, uh, uh, we, we, we have this center uh, sitting in T prime. And also, uh, the minus one eigenspace for T prime contains not only this subspace, but it also contains this subspace, which sits in another direct sum. So uh, the minus one eigenspace is bigger. The dimension, let me write down that the dimension. Well, I can even say that uh, I can even say that what I what I have just said, let me write it down that the minus one eigenspace for T prime for the D algebra of T prime is the sum of the minus one eigenspace for T. And the direct sum and this is greater than the minus one eigenspace of t because exactly it is greater because you add uh, some uh, sum of positive dimension so this dimension is bigger. i mean the equality does not hold since you did not prove that the centralizer of l is exactly is exactly the minus one eigenspace no, no, it is uh, the centralizer of the centralizer of L is not this eigenspace, but it contains this mi uh, minus one eigenspace, and at the same time, it it is contained uh, in T. This means so, that so because of these two inclusions. Oh, 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 oh I, I see. I, I, I confused. I confused something. Okay, okay. So the conclusion, which is important uh, for my purpose, is that uh, the dimension of this minus one eigenspace is bigger than the dimension of the minus one eigenspace of the torus uh, which we have chosen before. And this is the contradiction, because our assumption was uh, that uh, this torus T uh, 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 is such that this dimension is maximal possible. So we get a contradiction. Contradiction. And this contradiction proves the third lemma. Okay. 
okay? And now we are ready to prove the theorem, to finish the proof of the theorem. So, and of the proof of the theorem. Uh, we argue as follows. Well, first, let me draw a picture for you. Uh, so, uh, we have chosen uh, a maximal, uh, a theta stable maximal torus such that the dimension of the minus one eigenspace is maximal possible. And we have proved something about uh, its root system. So, let me draw a picture for you uh, how things look like uh, in this situation. Excuse me. Let me take a thin line. Just I'll draw something and then I'll explain what I have did what, <laughs> what I have drawn right now. Okay. So let is let it be like this. Actually, what I'm drawing uh, is the picture uh, is the picture for the uh, root system. So here, like this. So uh, we have uh, the vector space uh, spent by the character lattice, uh, say over the over rational numbers, uh, and uh, this uh, vector space is acted on by uh, theta by the involution theta in such a way that uh, it decomposes uh, into a direct sum of uh, eigenspaces with eigenvalue one, say this, uh, this plane uh, denotes uh, the eigenspace, excuse me, make it, make it thicker, uh, the eigenspace with eigenvalue one, here theta is identity, okay? And uh, the transversal uh, eigenspace um, uh, is the one with eigenvalue minus one, so that uh, theta acts in a sense as a reflection uh, with respect to this subspace. So this is a symbolic picture for the action of theta. And now we have a root system sitting in this vector space, uh, the root system. So say this is the origin. There are some roots which are theta stable, for instance, these roots uh, the set of these roots is symmetric Excuse me. So these roots are uh, uh, preserved by theta. Uh, and also there are some other roots which are not preserved by theta. They look in other directions, say here. And also you have an opposite root. This one. And also say this and the opposite one. Say yet another one and the opposite one. So this is the picture uh, for the root system. And my claim is uh, that we can choose we can choose uh, a hyperplane in the space uh, in the vector space spent by the character lattice. This uh, H script H uh, which does not contain roots and also having the following property 
uh, if you have a root which is positive or negative with respect to this hyperplane H, which lies in one of the half, half spaces uh, uh, by, in which uh, the hyperplane subdivides uh, the vector space. So if you have a positive or negative root beta uh, with respect to this hyperplane H, uh, and if this beta is not stable under theta, is not stable under theta, then its image is negative if beta was positive and is positive if beta was negative. So uh, briefly speaking, uh, this hyperplane H uh, can be chosen in such a way uh, that it takes positive uh, non-theta stable roots to negative ones and vice versa. So let me show you how to choose this hyperplane in the picture. Uh, choose the red, the red color for that. See. Uh, well, you, first you can choose uh, any hyperplane containing uh, these subspaces on which this subspace on which theta acts trivially. Uh, so this hyperplane will contain these roots, which are fixed by theta. But then you can move it slightly, something like this. So let me try to draw something, something like this. Okay, and also here you take something like this. And this is your choice uh, for H. I hope it is clear. The picture explains clearly how this H uh, looks like. So this is H. This is H. Uh, and uh, this choice of H uh, uh, allows one uh, to describe uh, both uh, the Borel subalgebra of G corresponding to this subdivision of roots uh, into positive and negative roots, and also the Lie algebra of the symmetric subgroup. So what we have then the Lie algebra of H which is just uh, the fixed point subalgebra uh, in G for the automorphism theta, can be described as follows. It is the direct sum of the uh, T-fixed uh, elements in, uh, in the Lie algebra of the torus, the uh, one eigenspace, eigenspace with eigenvalue one uh, in the torus, plus uh, the direct sum of those root subspaces which correspond to the roots fixed by theta, the previous lemma, lemma three, guarantees that if alpha is fixed by theta, then theta acts trivially on, on this root subspace. As for the remaining root subspaces corresponding to the roots um, which are not fixed by theta, they are interchanged under the action of theta. And if you want to pick uh, the uh, elements, the vectors fixed by theta, then you have to do the following. So you take the sum, the direct sum, over all pairs of beta, uh, which are non-theta stable and uh, its image under theta, over all such beta up to replacement with uh, its image under theta. You have to take a root vector in the root subspace corresponding to beta, 
uh, and you have to add the image of this root vector under theta, then you get to the root subspace corresponding to the image of beta, to this root. Uh, and you spend uh, the one-dimensional vector space by this sum of two root vectors. So uh, these are the only uh, theta fixed vectors uh, in the Lie algebra of G. So this is the description of the fixed point subalgebra for theta. Uh, and uh, it is uh, easy to see that uh, under this uh, choice of T, of, uh, of H, of the Borel subalgebra, so the Borel subalgebra is, as usual, the direct sum of T and those root subspaces corresponding to positive roots, regardless of whether they are theta stable or not, all positive roots. So these two decompositions uh, immediately imply that uh, the sum of the Borel subalgebra B and the Lie algebra H is the whole Lie algebra of G. And this is one of the conditions for sphericality. So we have proved uh, that uh, uh, the, symmetric, uh, the uh, symmetric space corresponding to this subgroup H is uh, spherical because this condition is equivalent to sphericality. So uh, the proof is complete. OK. Any questions so far? So in the decomposition of uh, H, the D algebra H, uh, yes. at the last part, so the beta uh, is from positive roots, right? Uh, well, yes. I mean, uh, uh, if, if you want to pick uh, uh, each sum and only once, then it's better to write, yeah, thank you for this, uh, thank you for this uh, addition. So it's better to write that uh, here that uh, we sum over positive roots. Thank you. Because if beta is positive, then theta of beta is negative uh, by what we have uh, explained here. Uh, and uh, if you take a negative root, then uh, vice versa, theta of beta will be positive. So we have to, uh, if, if you want to pick each pair only once, then uh, you have to take uh, to sum over positive roots. Thank you. Uh, more questions? I only want to ask one question. Uh, yes. The last page. Uh, the previous one. The previous page. Okay. Well, let's go there. I want, I want to ask uh, the uh, the centralizer of the eigenspace of minus one of t. Yes. Yes. This guy. Okay. In the eigenspace uh, of of root alpha that that fixed by theta. Well, I want to hear again why the, this subspace is contained in the center. Let me yeah. Let me explain again. So. Uh, the whole, the whole uh, torus T, or better to say it's Lie algebra, small t, acts on G alpha by multiplication with this character alpha. Okay? This is just yes. by definition. Okay. But now, uh, if you want to act by the Lie algebra, then you, uh, uh, you actually multiply by the differential of, of alpha. So I consider alpha as a linear function by taking its differential. So, but, uh, so the so so the Lie bracket is the differential of the uh, the uh, the junction represented. Yeah, let me let let, let me write explicitly uh, that if you take uh, maybe uh, in another color in red, so if you take uh, an element from T psi and an element from G alpha, say eta, then the Lie bracket equals alpha of psi times eta for any psi in the Lie algebra of T and eta in the root subspace corresponding to alpha, okay? So you mean that the Lie bracket is the differential of the, uh, of the, of the junction representation? 
Exactly, yes. Uh, the Lie bracket uh, is the differential uh, of the joint representation of the Lie, of the algebraic group. Yes, yes. This is just basically theorem. Uh, okay. So uh, uh, now, uh, uh, keeping in mind this formula, you see that uh, alpha is theta stable if and only if it vanishes on this subspace. And this holds if and only if uh, this subspace acts by uh, zero on G alpha. So if, if this multiple vanishes, then this means that commutator, the commutator is zero. Okay. So uh, alpha is uh, concluding alpha is theta fixed if and only if uh, this eigenspace T over minus theta centralizes, commutes with G alpha. Okay. This explains why these G alphas sit in the centralizer. And the other G alphas, by the same argument, you see that the others, the other G alphas, do not commute with this subspace. So they do not belong to the centralizer. This means that this is uh, a complete description on the centralizer. Okay? Is it clear? Yes, I know. Great, great. So uh, let me conclude the discussion uh, about uh, symmetric spaces by giving you uh, two exercises. So the first one, uh, take the first one is the following, take a vector space V of dimension N, which can be identified with K to the N vector space, which is equipped with a non-degenerate quadratic form. Let me denote it by Q. Uh, then we may consider the group G of orthogonal, uh, orthogonal transformations uh, with respect to this quadratic form uh, and with determinant one. So special orthogonal group corresponding to this uh, quadratic form Q on the vector space V. Of course, it is isomorphic just to the group of special orthogonal matrices of size n by n. And uh, uh, this group G acts, acts uh, on an algebraic variety Y, which is the set of subspaces in V of dimension, of fixed dimension, say dimension M, uh, uh, such that the restriction of Q on uh, this subspace is, uh, on this subspace is also non-degenerate. So you consider M dimensional subspaces in V uh, such that the restriction of the quadratic form uh, on uh, it, uh, on, the, on them, is non-degenerate as well. So this is an algebraic variety uh, contained in, this, in the Grassmannian of m-dimensional subspaces in V. And um, it is uh, just follows from basic linear algebra that uh, this uh, 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 sub-variety Y is homogeneous under the action of G. So all, all such subspaces are equivalent on, under orthogonal transformations with respect to this quadratic form. So this Y is a homogeneous space. And uh, 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 the exercise is to prove that Y is a symmetric space for the group G. Okay, so this is the first exercise, uh, and uh, the second exercise is a similar one. Now consider uh, a symplectic vector space of even dimensions, say 2n, symplectic vector space.
symplectic means equipped uh, with a non-degenerate skew symmetric uh, bilinear form, symplectic product. Uh, and uh, let's take for G the group of uh, all symplectic transformations of this symplectic vector space V, or if you like, it is the same as a group of symplectic 2n by 2n matrices. And consider the following uh, variety Y, whose points are pairs, say U1, U2, pairs of Lagrangian subspaces in V. Lagrangian means uh, isotropic with respect to uh, this symplectic form. So the symplectic form vanishes on, on the subspace and it is maximal by dimension. Uh, so isotropic uh, subspace of, of dimension n, one half of the dimension of V. This is what, what is Lagrangian. And uh, uh, we consider those pairs of Lagrangian subspaces uh, uh, which sum up to V. So the direct sum of u1 and u2 equals v. Again, this is a sub-variety in the, in the product now, in, it is in the product of two Grassmannians of uh, n-dimensional subspace, subspaces in v. And uh, again, uh, uh, the exercise is to prove that y is a symmetric space for the symplectic group. OK, so let me stop the first half uh, of my lecture here. Uh, if you have any questions, then please go For ahead. G or for G times G, the exercise G? No, 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 it is for G. It is for, for G, G itself. Oh. Yes. So G acts Q transitively on the Lagrangian subspace. Uh, yes, uh, well, well, well. Um, uh, G acts too transitively on, uh, on uh, on this kind of pairs, on, on pairs of uh, transversal Lagrangian subspaces. Okay. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. Because of course Lagrangian subspaces may intersect and uh, the dimension of the intersection is the invariant. Okay, so more questions if you have any. No questions so far. Well, let me uh, turn off uh, my microphone for a while, but if you have any questions, I'm still here. So if you have any questions, then just ask and I will switch on my microphone again and answer your question.
Okay, uh, so let me continue with my lecture, with the second half of my lecture. Uh, let me recall the main thesis uh, of my first lecture, that it is important to study equivariant compactifications of good homogeneous spaces. Uh, so for us, good means spherical. We have already seen that uh, it is a nice class of homogeneous spaces. For instance, uh, it is nice from the viewpoint of harmonic analysis. And we'll see other evidences that this class is nice uh, in the near future. Uh, as for uh, compactification, or in the language of algebraic geometry, it's better to say completions, uh, it is more convenient to study, uh, uh, to stay uh, at a bit more general viewpoint and uh, consider not only uh, true compactifications or completions, but also partial completions or in other language, open embeddings of spherical homogeneous spaces, uh, which are known under the name of spherical varieties. So now we turn from spherical homogeneous spaces to spherical varieties. Let me give you a formal definition. So uh, as before, uh, well, maybe before I give you a definition, let me recall basic notation. Uh, as before, let uh, G be a connected reductive algebraic group. And why be a homogeneous space, which is isomorphic to some quotient space, G mod H. Homogeneous space for the group G. Now definition. So uh, an equivariant open embedding of this homogeneous space Y uh, is uh, some algebraic variety X acted on by G, equipped with the action of G, which contains an open G orbit isomorphic to Y. You can say that it contains Y as an open and also dense orbit. Y is embedded into X, right? Exactly. Y is embedded into X as an open orbit. This density condition actually says that X is irreducible. It is automatically satisfied is X if X is irreducible because any open subset in an irreducible variety is dense. But also if uh, Y is dense, then X is automatically irreducible because G is connected and it follows that Y is reducible, an orbit of a connected reductive group is an irreducible variety, and its closure is also reducible. So uh, you, you, can you can replace this density assumption by saying that X is irreducible. It is just the same. Uh, we also call uh, equivariant open embeddings, uh, 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 briefly, uh, we call them G embeddings. So another short name is G embedding, G embedding of Y. Okay, now uh, a spherical variety is just by definition an open embedding in the above sense of a spherical homogeneous space. Arts need to be normal. 
so far not. Uh, uh, this normality assumption will come will come later. But uh, here in my definition, uh, I don't want to impose it. So far, I don't need it. But uh, indeed, you are right that uh, to construct uh, a nice theory, uh, you have to impose the normality assumption at some point. And I will say about it later. So thank you. Uh, equivalently, uh, you can say that uh, equivalently, Uh, uh, you can formulate this definition without uh, mentioning the open G orbit. So you can say that uh, a spherical variety is just an irreducible algebraic variety. Uh, say X equipped with an action of a connected reductive group G such that the Borel subgroup of G acts on X with open orbit. This is an equivalent definition because uh, if there is an open orbit for B, then the more so there is an open orbit for the bigger group G, and it contains the open B orbit, uh, and therefore this uh, open G orbit, bigger orbit, is a spherical homogeneous space, and X is its closure because it is reducible. Well, and conversely, if uh, you have a, an, a, an open embedding of a spherical homogeneous space, then it contains a, an open B orbit, uh, which is just the open B orbit in the spherical homogeneous space Y itself. So uh, this is a, an equivalent way to define what is a spherical variety. Let me give you some examples. Okay, so, so yes. why does G have... B has open orbit means that we have an open embedding of G quotient by B. Well, because uh, if B has an open orbit, then G has an open orbit. You just may take a, a point uh, in a B orbit, in, in the open B orbit, and uh, apply the group G to this point. Then you get an open G orbit containing the yes. initial open B orbit. Okay? Yes, the open G orbit. How, how can we conclude that this open G orbit is very spherical well because it contains the initial open b orbit we, we were starting from the open b orbit yeah from this the, one the, the open b orbit is spherical i how can no. i conclude that uh, i i mean i i mean well let's uh, digress on it a, a little bit so uh, uh so uh if if you have an open b orbit say b dot x open in big x then this implies that g dot x is uh, still open in x and also g dot x contains b dot x so this means that this guy let me denote it by y is a spherical homogeneous space what how can we conclude that y is spherical homogeneous oh oh because B has an well, open, again B has an because open y contains yes, this I, open orbit mm -hmm. yes yes i i i, I see that and, uh uh we learned we learned uh eight conditions it is one of the conditions i see yes so so you got it yes it's okay Okay, then maybe maybe I, I erase this these notes. Okay, so let me turn to examples. So the first one, uh, uh, we have a sphere of dimension n minus one, uh, which is a spherical homogeneous space. For the group S O N, 
sitting in the n-dimensional vector space. And we can take the projective closure of this sphere. So let me denote by x the projective closure of the sphere. It is a projective quadric given by the equation, well, say like this, x naught square plus x1 square plus etc. plus xn square equals to zero. This is a, a, a smooth projective quadric uh, in, in the n-dimensional projective space. So smooth projective, projective quadric. OK. Uh, uh, so this guy is the closure uh, of uh, the closure of uh, the sphere uh, in the ambient projective space, and it is still uh, it's it still uh, keeps uh, uh, carries on uh, the action of the group uh, uh, S O N. Uh, this group is extended to the project. Uh, this group action is extended to this projective space. Uh, so this is. Uh, uh, a G variety, a, a variety uh, for G uh, acted on by G, which is S S O N, uh, and it contains an open orbit, which is a spherical homogeneous space. So this uh, this is an example of a spherical variety. So smooth projective quadrics are spherical varieties for the orthogonal group. Okay. So uh, the second example is not a single quadric, uh, but the variety of all quadrics. So recall that uh, you have you have the space which I denoted as Q sub n, uh, the space or variety of smooth variety of smooth projective quadrics, variety of smooth projective quadrics. Which is a homogeneous space uh, for the group PGLN plus one, and the stabilizer is the projective orthogonal group. So this, uh, the points of this space QN are uh, smooth projective quadrics, uh, like like the one which we have seen before in the first example. But we can compactify this space by considering so it, it it is compactified to the space of all projective quadrics, including uh, including the singular ones. This is nothing but the projectivization of the space of symmetric n plus one by n plus one matrices. So this is a matrix uh, uh, of a quadratic form uh, in in projective coordinates defining uh, such a quadric. So uh, this is the variety variety of all uh, projective quadrics, including singular ones. The variety of all projective quadrics, not only smooth. So here. They were smooth, and now we consider all projective quadrics. And this is just a projective space, of course. The projectivization of the space of symmetric matrices is just a projective space, in this case of dimension, you can easily compute it, of dimension n times n plus 3 over 2, like this. Uh, so this is uh, this is uh, a symmetric. Uh, uh, this is a um, uh, spherical variety for the group PGLN plus one. So in this case, the group G. Well, I won't write it here because the group is visible from the from this formula on the left. So this is a, 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 a spherical variety for the group PGLN plus one. Uh, if you take, so the third example, uh, if you take uh, the variety of uh, smooth conics 
a particular case, which can be denoted smooth plane conics, which can be denoted as Q sub two, then it has another completion, which we have seen on the pre on the first lecture, the variety of complete conics. Variety of complete conics. Uh, this is a completion of the space Q2 different from the previous one, from the variety of old projective conics. Uh, and actually, uh, this is a nice completion, and uh, the construction of this completion can be extended to any n. So actually, such a completion exists uh, for the space Qn with any n, and even for more general uh, symmetric and non-symmetric uh, spherical homogeneous spaces. This is what, what is called a wonderful completion of a spherical homogeneous space, but so far we shall not elaborate on it. Okay, so uh, maybe yet another example. So uh, the previous examples were uh, projective varieties, projective spherical varieties, and now comes an example of an affine spherical variety, even a series of affine spherical varieties called the classical variety is called determinantal varieties. Determinantal. Determinantal. Varieties. So what is a determinantal variety? Let me denote uh, X sub R. This is a variety whose points are matrices of fixed size with a bounded ring. So the ring of the matrix S is at most R. This is an algebraic subvariety in the space of matrices, say, of size N cross M. Well, I should better uh, uh, include this uh, uh, row size and column size M and N in the notation, but let me, by abuse of notation, only keep the uh, rank in the notation, this letter R in the notation. Okay, so um, uh, what is the group? What is the acting group here? So the group G is the product of two uh, general linear groups, GLM cross GLN, uh, which acts on XR in the following way. So the first factor acts by left multiplications, and the second factor acts by right multiplications. Uh, let me explain why uh, this action is spherical. So why this uh, uh, variety, this determinantal variety XR is spherical for the action of G. Uh, let me choose uh, a Borel subgroup in G in the following way. So I will take uh, a product, the, the, the product of two Borel subgroups in the factors. So the first one will be The first one will be let me first draw the picture. Okay. And the second one will be in GLN. Okay, so um, for the Borel subgroup, I will take uh, the product of uh, the product of uh, two Borel subgroups. So in GLM, I will take lower triangular matrices, lower triangular matrices, and in GLM, I will take upper triangular matrices. And the product of these two will be a Borel subgroup in G. So um, how does this B act 
on a given matrix of uh, of rank uh, at most r. So let me show you uh, uh, where it takes a given matrix uh, of rank r. So you have such a matrix. Okay. So what can you do? What can you do uh, by acting uh, with um, uh, with this uh, Borel subgroup by acting uh, uh, by multiply? What, what what can you do with the matrix by multiplying it on the left by an a lower triangular matrix and on the right by an upper triangular matrix? So uh, uh, it is easy to see uh, that uh, uh, what you can do you can uh, to each row. To each row of this matrix, you can add rows which are above, uh, which are um, above this row. So on the rows, uh, the action is in this direction, and on the columns, uh, you can uh, uh, add when you multiply on the right by an upper triangular matrix. You can add to each column the columns which are before. Uh, on the left from this column. So the action is in this direction. And of course, of course, also you can add, you can multiply each row by a non-zero factor and each column by a non-zero factor. This I indicate by these arrows corresponding to rows and columns. So this is uh, how the Borel subgroup acts on a given matrix X in my variety. And it is easy to see that uh, you can take such a matrix to the canonical form, namely So you can take such a matrix to a canonical form. Namely, uh, if, uh, if all upper left corner minors these minors if all these minors are non zero uh, then uh, you can uh, subtract the first row say starting from the first row you can subtract the first row from all other rows and obtain zeros in the first column in here, because this upper corner element is non-zero. And you can subtract the first columns, uh, the, the first column from all other columns and obtains, uh, obtain zeros in the first row. Again, because this element is non-zero, you can do this. And also you can multiply the first row or the first column by some multiple, by some non-zero multiple and obtain uh, unity here obtain unity element here and zeros in the first column and the first row after that using that uh, the second left uh, uh, upper uh, corner minor is non-zero you can do the same thing with the second row and the second column and going this way you can take your matrix to the following canonical form with units on the diagonal uh, uh, with the number of these units equal to R and zeros in all other places. So you can take a matrix uh, in uh, of rank at most R to this form by acting with B, with upper and lower triangular matrices from the right and from the left. If 
let me emphasize that you can do it if uh, these upper left corner minors are non-zero. So let me write it that uh, as follows. The determinant of each matrix x, i, j with i and j arranging uh, in the range from 1 to k. Well, the left the lower, the right lower corner is also zero, right? The right lower corner? Not necessarily. It depends on the rank. It depends on the rank and on the size. If your R is small, then uh, then uh, smaller than uh, M and N, then uh, of course you have zeros. Uh, you will have zeros uh, in the last line, in the last row and last column. So uh, I can only say what happens uh, in the first uh, R diagonal entries. If this condition holds, if these minors were K, ranges from 1 to R are non-zero. So if these minors, uh, these are these minors, which you see, if these minors are non-zero, then uh, you can take, by the action of B, you can take any matrix with these conditions, satisfying these conditions, uh, to, this, uh, to this fixed canonical form. Uh, let me denote uh, this matrix in some canonical way. Let it be, say, x sub r, like this. Okay? Uh, uh, so we see that uh, these inequalities, uh, which you see here, actually define us uh, the open Borel orbit. So this defines... the open Borel orbit. Uh, this is just the orbit of this uh, prescribed point, x sub r, of this canonical point. So we see that, uh, we see that uh, the determinantal variety x r contains an open orbit for the Borel subgroup. Uh, and also, we have to check that this orbit is dense, or the other way around, we can check irreducibility. Of the determinantal variety, this is maybe easier. Irreducibility. Uh, this is because uh, the whole determinantal variety can be obtained as the G span of a closed subvariety X sub R, Z, Z sub R, where Z sub R is just the set of matrices of the following form. Uh, we have something on the diagonal starting from the upper left corner in the first R diagonal entries. And zeros in the other entries. So uh, this closed subvariety in X sub R is just isomorphic to the affine space of dimension R. And the whole determinantal variety uh, is uh, a G span uh, for this Z sub R because any matrix of rank at most R can be put to this form uh, by multiplication with degenerate matrices on the left and on the right. This is a classical matrix algebra, which is, I hope it is clear for you. So uh, this is an example, yet another example of a spherical variety. It is an irreducible algebraic variety with the action of this reductive group G, such that the Borel subgroup of G, this one, has an open orbit. Okay? And maybe the last example, 
which is not a single example, uh, but a class of examples, a big class of examples. Uh, the last uh, example is toric varieties. Toric varieties. So uh, what is a toric variety? In this case, the acting group G is the same as B. It is just an algebraic torus. So it, it is uh, the same as T, and it is just an algebraic torus. So algebraic tori are uh, particular examples of reductive groups, connected reductive groups. And in this case, uh, all these three subgroups, the whole group G, the Borel subgroup, and the maximal torus just coincide. It is one and the same group. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, the spherical variety corresponding to uh, the action of a torus is called the toric variety. So uh, by definition, a toric variety contains an open orbit for this algebraic torus T. But this quotient space is also a torus. Since T is commutative, uh, the subgroup H is normal, and the quotient space is also an algebraic group, and it is again a torus. And moreover, the action of H, of the stabilizer subgroup uh, uh, H, on X is trivial, again because of commutativity of the whole group. Uh, and we may replace the acting group, uh, the acting group T, by its quotient. So we may we can mod out the uh, kernel of the action. Uh, so in this case, we may assume that the stabilizer is just trivial. Uh, in other words. The homogeneous space Y is identified with the group T itself, on which T acts by left multiplication. So uh, under this assumption, a toric variety is just an open embedding of an algebraic torus, so that the action of a torus on itself by left multiplication is extended to the open embed. This is what, what is usually uh, understood uh, uh, for, uh, under the name of toric variety. But a more general viewpoint is that uh, you need not to assume that the torus T acts uh, effectively, faithfully. Uh, you may uh, assume also that it has some kernel. Sometimes it is convenient uh, to make this more general assumption. Well, OK. So uh, more examples will follow. Uh, and now uh, let me briefly uh, describe uh, the main topics uh, arising in the theory of spherical varieties, which I'm going to touch uh, in my course. So topics. Uh, the first one is the classification of spherical varieties. classification of spherical varieties. This naturally subdivides in two parts. Uh, the first one is classification of spherical homogeneous spaces. And the second part is a classification of embeddings, of open embeddings, or partial completions, if you like, uh, 
of a given spherical homogeneous space. This means that you fix uh, a spherical homogeneous space and study all uh, spherical varieties, all spherical varieties, which contains this given fixed spherical homogeneous space as an open orbit. Um, uh, we shall see. So uh, uh, speaking about the second, uh, the second uh, problem, the second uh, topic, the second question, we shall see uh, uh, in the near future in my lectures that um, uh, this, can, this classification of open embeddings of a given spherical homogeneous space can be performed in terms of certain uh, data of combinatorial and geometric nature. So let me write it that this leads us to a bunch of combinatorial and geometric data. Uh, and actually, uh, it turns out that these data are very helpful in the second uh, topic, in studying the geometry of spherical, homogene of spherical uh, varieties, in studying the geometry of spherical varieties. Uh, and the third uh, topic, which I am going to touch to discuss in my lectures, is applications of uh, spherical varieties applications of spherical varieties in geometry. and representation theory. So uh, my goal now, my first goal is uh, uh, with this first topic, uh, that is uh, to develop, to develop the classification uh, of spherical varieties. Uh, well, uh, the first part uh, of this classification problem, that is the classification of spherical homogeneous spaces, uh, turns out to be more complicated than the second part, that is classification of uh, spherical varieties with uh, given open orbit. Uh, still, uh, I can say that a complete classification of spherical homogeneous spaces is uh, known by now. And surprisingly, it also relies uh, on the same uh, combinatorial data, uh, which appear in the solution of the second part of the classification problem, uh, classification of embeddings of a given fixed uh, spherical homogeneous spaces. Uh, so uh, uh, we'll speak about, uh, I hope we'll have some time to speak about classification uh, of spherical homogeneous spaces at the end of my lecture course. But now we start uh, with the second part of the classification problem, we fix uh, a spherical homogeneous space, which will be an open orbit, and uh, try to classify all spherical varieties containing a given uh, spherical homogeneous space as the open orbit. Uh, actually, uh, we shall solve this problem uh, under mild assumptions on singularities of spherical varieties under consideration. So uh, let me first make a digression on singularities uh, of algebraic varieties. If you have no questions so far about these general pictures, or maybe there are some questions, then please uh, ask them. Are there any questions? Uh, I have a question. Yes, um, please. Concerning toric varieties over uh, just over the top of this page, 
Um, yes. Do we have any assumption for the subgroup H so that T quotient H is still a torus? Or uh, no, no, no. Uh, it is uh, you need you need no assumption for that. So the quotient of a torus uh, by any closed subgroup in it is always a torus. And okay. would you please tell me? And um, I I want to sp uh, specify an explicit example. Consider the multiplicative group as GM, and we quotient it out by the subgroup, a finite subgroup consisting of plus and minus one. And why yes. is the torus? Well, it is again GM. It is still GM. Uh, the quotient map uh, uh, sends. Um, well, if you take, let me. Let me write it here, maybe. So GM, in my notation, it is K star, yeah? The multiplicative group of the field. So K star modulo plus minus one, yeah? It is, again, isomorphic to K star because the quotient map just sends uh, T to T square. This is a quotient map, OK? Did I explain? Yeah, thanks. OK, good. So then let me erase this. Well, if there are no more questions here, then let me turn to the next page. I want to make a, a small digression by recalling you well, I hope you know this material, but anyway, to fix notation and uh, for uh, other natural purposes, uh, let me recall some basic things about uh, singularities uh, of algebraic varieties. So digression. On singularities. of algebraic varieties. OK. So as usual, uh, let me denote by x an algebraic variety over my base field k. And small x will be a point in big X. So uh, I recall you what is a local ring of a point. The usual notation is O sub x big, comma x small, or just O sub x small in short. It is the direct limit of rings of regular functions over all neighborhoods of x. So if you have your x, your variety x, this is big x, and you, you if you have a point, small x in here, uh, then you consider functions which are regular, which are defined and regular in a certain neighborhood, certain open subset u uh, containing x. But you are interested in these functions only up to uh, uh, shrinking the neighborhood. So uh, uh, you are interested in, in behavior of such a function only in uh, a neighborhood of, of this point, which can be arbitrarily small. This means that you identify two functions uh, if they coincide on a small neighborhood, maybe on a smaller neighborhood of x. OK? So uh, uh, algebraically, this means that uh, you have a restriction of functions. You have a homomorphism from the uh, uh, algebra of regular functions on U to the algebra of regular functions on the smaller neighborhood, say U prime. Uh, and uh, uh, these uh, algebras of regular functions on all neighborhoods of the point X form a directed system, and you can take the direct limit of this directed system. So essentially, this means that you consider functions which are regular in some neighborhood of X, and uh, you identify those functions which coincide in a neighborhood of X, maybe smaller than their domains of definition. This is a local ring. And... Um, 
this local ring is indeed a local ring in the sense of commutative algebra. It contains a unique maximal ideal. Let me denote it by German M, M sub X. Uh, this maximal idea consists of uh, all functions which vanish at the point X. So this is a vanishing ideal. at the point x. And now uh, the tangent space, or better say, better to say the Zariski tangent space, of the variety x at the point small x, Zariski tangent space, which is denoted like this, is by definition the dual of the quotient space of this maximal ideal, vanishing ideal at x modulo x square. It is a finite dimensional vector space and uh, its dual is by definition the Zariski tangent space of my algebraic variety x at, at this given point. Uh, what is the meaning of this definition? What is geometric meaning? Well, uh, I hope you know this, but let me say that um, if you have a tangent vector, let me draw it here, some tangent vector, psi, uh, psi in the tangent space. And if you have a function f in the local ring, then this function may be uh, not in the maximal ideal, but when you subtract the value at the point x, f minus this constant, f of x, then this guy belongs to the maximal ideal. And if you take it modulo the square of the maximal ideal, then you get uh, to this quotient space and evaluate the vector psi at this vector in the quotient space because psi is a linear function on this quotient space. Then uh, this is what is usually called the directional derivative. The, di the derivative of uh, f uh, in the direction of psi at the point x, which is denoted like this. So derivative Of, of f at x in direction psi. And it can be written in coordinates uh, in the, with the usual by the usual formula. So I, I, I will skip this. And also yet another uh, yet another notation for this is the value of the differential of f at x at the tangent vector uh, xi. So this differential of f at x is formally uh, this guy on the left, on the left of this comma. This is f minus its value at x considered modulo the square of the vanishing ideal. But this is more common uh, in the language of differential geometry. So this is about Zariski tangent space. And now uh, let me briefly recall you that the dimension, so maybe I should turn to the next page. Uh, the dimension of the Zariski tangent space at any point is bigger or equal than the dimension of the variety x itself at the point x. So this local dimension means, by definition, maximum of the dimensions of irreducible components of x containing passing through this point, containing the point x. So this xi, x sub i, 
are irreducible components. Irreducible components of X. So we take into account only those components which contain this given point. And then what, what we get is the local dimension of my algebraic variety at the point X. And by the way, the dimension of an irreducible variety, uh, so the dimension of this component Xi, well, this can be defined in different ways, but let me just write that uh, you can define it as the transcendence degree of the field of rational functions over the base field. So you look at how many algebraically independent uh, rational functions you have on your irreducible variety. And this number is a dimension. Okay, uh, then let me uh, remind you uh, uh, that uh, in view of this uh, inequality, we have the following alternative. So this dimension of the Zariski tangent space can be either bigger than the dimension of x at the point small x or equal to this dimension. So in the first case, we say that x the point X is smooth. So X is a smooth point. Another name is regular. Regular point. If there is an equality of dimensions, if the dimension of the Zariski tangent space is equal to the local dimension of X, and X is singular, if we have a strict inequality here, if the dimension of the Zariski tangent space is strictly bigger, uh, so we have the smooth locus, the set of all smooth points, denoted x over reg, the smooth or regular locus, if you like. It is an open, dense subset of x. And the singular locus denoted x sing. It is just the complementary set. It is a closed subset of smaller dimension. And also it is known that uh, if a point is contained in several irreducible components uh, of X, it is always singular. This means that the singular locus contains uh, intersections of two irreducible components. So if you have a smooth point, then there is only one irreducible component to which this point belongs. Okay, so uh, to conclude, uh, to conclude uh, uh, this, uh, uh, to conclude my lecture, uh, let me just uh, remark that uh, singularities of an algebraic variety can be quite bad, or alternatively, they can be relatively well behaved. So uh, we shall impose uh, some mild restriction on singularities. Namely, uh, uh, we shall assume that uh, our varieties, which we shall consider in particular spherical varieties, are normal. Uh, I don't have time to recall this notion of normality now, but uh, I will start with it uh, uh, on my next lecture, at the beginning of my next lecture. So uh, uh, I'll stop now. Thank you for your attention. And if you still have any questions, then Please, I'm ready to answer. Any questions or comments? Professor, so yes. I have a question uh, about, so uh, above uh, the last page. The... This one. Yes, so the inner product or taking the value here this is not an inner product this is a pairing so this guy is uh, in this space sitting uh, in brackets and this yes, guy yes. is in the dual space this is a pairing okay mm -hmm. yeah yes so uh, 
how can I and compare this to the uh, to the one of the classical uh, dif differential in uh, differential geometry? Well, I would say uh, that sure. if, uh, yeah, yeah, I understand your question. I understand your question. Well, of course, everything is compatible. So uh, uh, when you uh, when you are on the side of a classical differential geometry, for instance, you consider uh, uh, an algebraic variety over the field of complex numbers. So in this case, uh, K, uh, let K be the field of complex numbers. And X, let X be smooth, non-singular. Uh, uh, this means that actually X can be considered uh, as a, uh, an analytic manifold, a complex analytic manifold, okay? Yes. So uh, in this case, uh, this Zariski tangent space is identified canonically with the tangent space in differential geometry. Because, um, uh, so there are many ways to define tangent vectors in differential geometry. And one of the ways is to consider derivatives along these vectors, yeah? So what are derivatives? Derivatives are some uh, operators uh, or maybe some uh, linear functionals on the set of functions defined in the neighborhood of, of a point, uh, which uh, have uh, a certain formal properties. They are linear, they satisfy Leibniz uh, rule, yeah, and so on. So if you take a classical uh, tangent vector in terms of differential geometry and consider the directional derivative uh, in the direction of this vector, then you get um, uh, a linear function on, on this local ring, on the set of, on the ring of functions defined in the neighborhood of X. And this linear function, uh, well, actually uh, satisfies this assumption. So it, it uh, well, of course it vanishes on constants. So you may ignore constants. You, uh, you have only to restrict uh, this function uh, to this vanishing ideal. Uh, and uh, the uh, derivation uh, along the classical tangent vector vanishes on the square of the vanishing ideal. So you get uh, a vector, uh, a tangent vector in, in this sense. Uh, you get uh, something in the dual space of this quotient. Did I answer your question? Or you still have to specify some points? Yeah, I I think that uh, maybe if we have f here, then we subtract its value at x, so we are um, consider its linear part, right? And we mod the uh, m square means we just ignore the higher terms. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Just, exactly. Yeah. You are interested only in the first order terms uh, of the expansion yeah. of your function at the point x. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm confused why when we take the um, take a pair, it's just the uh, it's just the derivative of f x, x in direction. Can see here. Well, let me let, let me let me let me like uh, let me write like this. So uh, maybe uh, I would uh, better explain it using local coordinates. So if you have local coordinates x one, etc., x n, uh, then uh, you can uh, take a Taylor expansion of your function f. It is the constant, uh, the value at x plus the sum of partial derivatives. Excuse me. Let me write it shorter like this. Partial derivatives of f at the point x times xi times something of higher order, right? And when you take a tangent vector in the classical sense and you take the directional derivative of this guy, then you get this sum. Right? So this is the classical formula. So this d sub i is just partial derivative along the i-th coordinate. So uh, this is a classical formula in the differential geometry, right? Let me see. Yes. So okay. we're taking, taking the 
taking the origin here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, of course, uh, uh, the coordinate system is centered at the point X. So X is the origin okay. for local coordinates. Yes. So uh, and uh, uh, this formula also uh, gives you a linear function of this quotient space, because if you take the maximal ideal, uh, uh, vanishing ideal at X, it is generated by uh, this X i's. And if you mod out its square, then uh, you consider uh, these generators as uh, linear generators uh, over, over the field C, over complex numbers, uh, for this vector space. So uh, the local coordinates, or uh, better to say their images in the quotient space, form the basis of this quotient space. And this is a general, uh, this is a general, uh, well, if, if you denote, uh, if you denote these numbers, um, this, um, this uh, partial derivatives, this, these are some constants, if you denote them as C sub I, then you get just uh, the sum over I, uh, C I, dot psi i. So uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, C sub i's are just coordinates in this quotient space. Because you decompose, uh, you decompose the, uh, uh, the first order part of f with respect to the basis uh, of the quotient space, okay? And this is a general form for the linear functional uh, on, on, on this vector space. So you just take the coordinates and multiply them by some, by some numbers. So uh, this shows you that uh, any tangent vector in the classical sense defines a linear function on this quotient space and vice versa. Any li linear function of this quotient space comes from some tangent vector in the sense of classical differential geometry. So I hope that uh, it is more clear now. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. More questions? Oh, hello, hello, Professor. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I have the question. So is it easy to see this, this, this tiny space? So its dimension is, is finite. Uh, uh, how I see that the dimension is finite? Yeah, is it easy to see that? Well, well, I mean, uh, well, relatively easy, but uh, you you need some commutative algebra or some algebraic geometry. Uh, it is it is not yeah, it is not complicated. Okay. Uh, uh, I I think you can find different arguments in various textbooks on algebraic geometry. There are elementary arguments or more involved uh, using say Nakayama lemma, but uh, it is not uh, not that complicated. It is a basic fact. Mm -hmm. So, so could this, uh, could this dimension be, be quite large? This, this dimension can be large, yes. This dimension can be bigger, uh, much bigger actually than the dimension of X itself, than the dimension of the variety. And actually the larger is the dimension of the Zariski tangent space, the more singular is the point X. So the dimension of the Zariski tangent space is in a sense a measure for singularity. It can be very big. Mm -hmm. Okay, so by the way, uh, I'm I'm a bit, a bit confused. So in our course, why do we need to concern this 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 issue? Uh, why so, why so, do we need? So, uh, so make okay, a... my question is, uh, uh, why do we need to talk, talk, talk about talk about the singularities of of talk, talk about the, 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 the singularities? Well. Uh, I want to say, but uh, this I will do already on my next lecture, I want to say that uh, it is uh, reasonable uh, to impose uh, some assumption that the singularity should not be very bad. Okay, uh, I, I, will, I will explain what does it mean, not very bad. Uh, in my next lecture, the beginning of my next lecture, namely, uh, uh, I will impose the assumption that the singularities are normal. Okay, this is okay. a name. So normal, normal, normal singularities. I will explain ex precisely what does it mean. Recall for you, but okay, uh, actually um, uh, the reason for that is that otherwise you cannot uh, construct a good theory. Okay. 
the best the best situation of course uh, is the smooth case but it is too restrictive oh i see mm -hmm. and normality is not restricted okay so so professor other questions i have a question about Please? some algebraic uh, geometry uh, if the variety x is embedded into some uh, projective space say like and the n-dimensional projective space. Well, yes. Uh, could we control the ta tangent space of the singular dimension of the uh, singular point by the dimension of the ambient? Yes, projective? yes, yes, sure. Of course, of course. Uh, let me again write something. So more generally, more generally, if you have an embedding uh, of, of algebraic varieties. So if one algebraic variety is embedded to another one, say x embedded to x prime. Uh, so if you have a point uh, uh, in, in the smaller variety, yeah, then uh, you have a natural embedding for tangent spaces. So the tangent space uh, for x at small x is naturally embedded in the tangent space for x prime at the same point. So in your situation, uh, the question which you ask uh, is uh, where this x prime is a projective space of dimension n. And in this case, of course, this guy is uh, of dimension n. So you have a bound uh, for dimension. Oh, and, and one more question yes well are we are, are we as a field k uh, always considered the complex number c well if if it is not c how can we say about the torus uh well uh first of all my assumption on the base field on the base field is that it is algebraically closed of zero characteristic. You may, of course, uh, uh, these things are much more general. But yes. let me, yeah. I know so, there are many, many uh, algebraic closed fields with characteristics zero. Um, I mean, how can we define torus? Torus, torus. Uh, I, I, I know an algebraic variety is uh, is uh, abelian variety is an algebraic variety that is also an abelian algebraic group. Uh, however, I don't think uh, in other fields they they are called torus. Well, uh, uh, since you are speaking about L a abelian varieties, this is not uh, the tori which I consider. So I consider algebraic tori. So what are algebraic tori? Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. I, I forgot. That there are non algebraic tori. Yeah. I, I talk, I'm talking about algebraic tori. Well, uh, how can we define algebraic tori if, uh, if we. If well, the uh, base field basically is in the same way. So, uh, an algebraic torus is a product, a direct product of several copies of the multiplicative group of your base field. Or, in the language of algebraic geometry, you take a, a, a product of several copies of the puncture affine line. So you take the affine line, A1, remove uh, the origin, and take the product of several copies of this guy. This you can do over any field. So uh, I, I, I think that some students previously asked that how how can we deduce the quotient of an of a torus? Uh, the quotient group of torus is also a torus. So does it come from the algebraic closeness of K? Well, uh, uh, well, uh, if you consider non-algebraically closed field, then you have to specify what what do you mean by a torus? The, the usual convention is that. Uh, a torus uh, is um, uh, uh, is an algebraic variety, an algebraic group defined over some field, which becomes uh, uh, which becomes uh, of this form when you uh, pass to the algebraic closure, when you change the base field uh, to the algebraic closure. 
uh, but uh, uh, if you define uh, a torus over an algebraically closed field uh, uh, in the way which I have j just have said, then uh, you get that the quotient of a torus is again a torus. This doesn't mean that it decomposes in this way. This is not necessarily so, but uh, I mean, uh, over the algebraic closure, it becomes a split. So it decomposes like this, but over the algebraic, uh, algebraic closure of K. Well, well, you, you mean, oh, oh, I'm not asking this. I'm asking uh, the question of an algebraic torus is also a torus. How can we prove that? Do we use the algebraic closeness of K? Uh, well, you may uh, you may first you may first prove it for the algebraic closure over the algebraic over the algebraic closure of K, which I didn't do by the way. I just uh, considered an example, a single example, but uh, I didn't prove the general statement. But uh, oh, oh, you so can... you didn't prove that? Well, no, no, I... no. I didn't prove. This is again. This is a standard fact from the theory of algebraic groups. I refer to such standard for such standard facts. I refer to textbooks like Humphrey's book. So, so we have the subgroups and uh, quotient groups of algebraic torus, uh, the algebraic mm -hmm. subgroups and the algebraic quotient groups of an algebraic torus is always a torus, right? Yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. For the subgroup, for a subgroup, it is not true because a subgroup may be disconnected. If you oh, take I mean, a connected algebraic the subgroup, the algebraic subgroup, an algebraic subgroup still may be disconnected. It may have several connected components. Oh, and connect but, the identity co component is torus, right? Yeah, exactly. The identity component is a torus, a subtorus. This is a this is a theorem. Yeah, and the quotient group is always a torus. Here, it doesn't matter whether the subgroup is connected or not. The quotient group is always a torus. Okay. More questions. Oh, oh, oh hello, professor. So yes, please. You, you mentioned that you we have uh, you are going to discuss you are going to talk about uh, three topics in, in the in the following course, right? Yes. So so I'm wondering so why why you consider the applications, uh, where so when we when we consider the applications in geometry and the and the the, the representation theory, do we yeah. need to use the the so, so the first part the the first topic the about the the classification, classification of yes yeah, doing well the, i i, I would say one. yeah yeah i think i got your question i would say that uh, uh things go like this so to solve the classification problem you mm. have to develop some structure theory yes this right. structure theory is encoded in this combinatorial data Mm -hmm. And these combinatorial data are used to study uh, uh, the geometry of spherical varieties, and they are used in applications. So this is I how see. things how things are organized. So I will so, start with this part, and then I turn to this. Okay, I see. Oh, thank you. Okay, you are welcome. More questions, comments. Professor, so um, just before you talk about if x is embedded in another variety, then its tangent space is yes. Yes. So here we can say that if we have embedding, so we have the control of the singularity, and. So well, I wouldn't say we have a control over singularity. We have control over uh, only uh, on the dimension of the Zariski tangent space. But still, I mean, if this n is very big, so suppose that the dimension of x is small and the dimension uh, of the ambient projective space is very big, then this uh, the singularity at, at this point can be arbitrarily bad. So it is a mild control. You control over the dimension. And even this can be very big. Yes. Uh, can we um, can we just have immersion instead of embedding? Uh, well, I mean, um, um, 
uh, if you have an immersion like this, uh, well, well, this is this again. Uh, this again uh, depends on what you understand by an immersion. For instance, if you have an immersion like this, so your x is just some non-singular curve. And if you have an immersion of this non-singular curve, say to the plane, such that that this point becomes singular, then um, uh, the I would say um, uh, the Zariski tangent space, uh, the Zariski tangent space uh, of this guy, is just a line, and the Zariski tangent space of uh, this point is a plane. So, um, uh, if you consider X as an immersed variety in X prime, then uh, uh, the Zariski tangent space maybe may differ. You may get more singular points. But in principle, yes, um, uh, the embedding still holds. So this embedding still holds. More questions? Yes. And do we use blow up to be singular, the singularities? Uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, maybe you, are, you you wonder if we shall use blow up in my lectures. Uh, well, probably at some time, but uh, 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 I mean, uh, I will rather uh, uh, I will rather use um, uh, in particular for desingularization, for instance, for desingularization of spherical no, I mean, varieties. I I'm I'm not. We're very familiar with blow ups. I hope we can use less such techniques. Yeah, yeah, I understand your question. Well, uh, maybe, maybe I will mention blow ups, but I, I will not use them systematically. Uh, I will not use blow ups systematically uh, in uh, desingularizing. Uh, I will use rather some uh, combinatorial technique based on on. Um, well, based, 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 based on some toric geometry, uh, when I need to desingularize something, uh, but of course this eventually uh, will contain, uh, will, will involve blow ups, but uh, implicitly in an implicit way. So um, uh, I won't say that uh, blow ups are a keystone uh, tool in, in in what I am going to to tell you. By the way, uh, of course, uh, uh, let me emphasize again that all these things from algebraic geometry or algebraic groups, which I uh, recall for you, uh, are very sketchy. Uh, I just uh, want to recall something to introduce some notation, to, 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 to agree about notation, about terminology. It is not to teach you algebraic geometry. I assume that it is uh, that you know algebraic geometry to some extent. And uh, if you miss something, then it is better to address textbooks. Uh, I can explain only briefly uh, uh, some basic terms and facts from algebraic geometry, which I need uh, for my lectures. Because the scope of this course is uh, beyond algebraic geometry. It is not basic algebraic geometry, it is some, something more special. But of course, uh, you may ask questions. Uh, if I can easily answer, then I will do. So, uh, are there any more questions left? If not, then let me stop sharing.